So my name is Jonathan Bamber. I'm a professor of physical geography at University of Bristol and I'm director of the Bristol Glaciology Centre. Um, I'm actually a physicist but also a glaciologist and I study the polar regions using satellite uh, remote sensing techniques. The cryosphere is basically all frozen uh, land and ice on the surface of the earth. So it's, it's not just, so cryosphere means the cold environment or the cold component, the frozen component of the earth. So that includes seasonal snow cover, which it mainly covers quite a large part of uh, northern hemisphere seasonally in winter. Um, it includes sea ice, which I mentioned earlier, glaciers, ice caps, ice sheets, and permafrost. Now permafrost is frozen soil where um, it's, it's, it's frozen throughout the year and there's a thin layer of soil at the surface called the active layer which melts in summer but underneath it's permanently frozen. So those are all the components of the craft. Have I left, left anything out? Well there is river and lake ice as well which is so for example in, in parts of uh, Arctic Canada lake ice is very important for um, the hydrological cycle and th the ecosystem as well because because when you've got frozen ground it suppresses the exchange of moisture energy and uh, gases like carbon dioxide between the atmosphere and the surface so it, it, it controls all sorts of processes. So sea ice is um, a sort of thin skim of ice that forms seasonally so it, it's a maximum in winter in the Arctic and maximum in the Southern Ocean in the Arctic and it's only about one to five meters thick something like that and then in the summer it gets much smaller because um, you know, you've got atmospheric warming and you've got um, changes in circulation so it responds to both mechanical forcing and what's called thermodynamics the warming of the surface and so that it waxes and wanes annually. Um, it goes from a minimum of about 4 million square kilometers in the Arctic to something like 18 million square kilometers. So it's big variation. And because it's floating on the surface of the ocean, it doesn't really have any impact on sea level because it's in what's called hydrostatic equilibrium. It's just sitting there like a, your little um, uh, glass, uh, your little ice cube in a glass, you know, if you melt it the volume in the glass doesn't change at all. Um, land ice is completely different. Land ice is sitting on land as the name suggests, so that's glaciers and most of the ice sheets that cover Greenland and Antarctica. Um, and because they're on land, they're not in hydrostatic equilibrium and they are much thicker. So in Antarctica, the ice is up to five kilometers thick. That's three and a half miles thick. And if you melt that, it goes into the ocean and it changes the mass of the ocean and therefore oceans, the ocean level goes up. And if you melt both Antarctica and Greenland, and I'm not suggesting this is going to happen tomorrow, but if you did dump them both into the ocean, global sea level will go up by something like 65 metres. So that's about 200 feet. So that's a, that's a big effect. The principle that um, when you melt a piece of land ice, and you melt it and it goes into the ocean, is, 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 it's, it's not even what I would really call physics. It's a very basic mechanics. It's, it goes back to Archimedes' principle, which is, you know, he sat in a bath and the water level goes up. That's it. It's that simple. So I use satellite observations of primarily looking at Greenland and the Antarctic ice sheet to understand how they're behaving and um, how they're volume and mass is changing with time, particularly how it's responding to what we call external forcing. That's changes in the oceans or changes in the atmosphere. Um, and I mean, the technology is quite complex. Some of the principles are really simple, but the, the satellites, I mean, it is literally rocket science. You know, this stuff is pretty, pretty sophisticated technology. Um, one of the main techniques we use is to measure the change in volume of the ice sheets using something called a satellite altimeter. Now, altimeters measure elevate, the elevation of the surface very accurately. And these altimeters, there are two, two types that have been flown, a laser and radar altimeter. They can measure changes in elevation to a few millimeters a year. You know, they, and, and they're flying at altitudes of 600 miles, 1,000 kilometers above the surface, and they're measuring you know, one or two millimeters change a year. So it's pretty impressive technology. And they do that over the whole continent. 
And um, the, I, I mean, the, con the concept actually is, is quite straightforward. They send a pulse of energy, electromagnetic radiation, down to the surface. It bounces off the surface, goes back to the satellite, and you measure the time delay. And how long it takes from the satellite back down, um, if you know how fast the EM radiation is traveling, you, you've got an estimate or measurement of the range, the distance from the satellite to the surface. That's it. But in between, there's, you know, trying to measure a millimeter over a thousand kilometers, it's, it's quite, quite difficult. The other really incredible piece of technology or sort of approach that is used for measuring how, how the ice mass is evolving is, is by looking at um, changes in the gravity field of the Earth. As mass goes from the land into the ocean, the gravity field locally on the surface of the Earth changes. And with incredibly sensitive satellite technology, you can actually measure those very small changes in the gravity field. And that tells you what's, where the mass is going. They're measuring two quite different things. The altimetry is measuring the volume of an ice mass, and that is not exactly the same thing as the change in mass, or because, because the volume, um, to go from volume to mass, you need to know the density of your snow or your ice. Now, we know the density of ice, but in Antarctica, um, there's a layer of snow, which is called fern, which is up to 120 meters thick, which is compressing very slowly under its own weight. And that rate of compression changes with time. So sometimes it, it's faster, sometimes slow. And that's got nothing to do with the mass of the ice sheet. It's just snow compacting. And so you have to deal with that. Now, now the gravity measurements, they, they, they don't measure uh, volume. They measure a change in mass, but um, convolved or, or combined with the change in um, land ice and ocean are lots of other processes related to change in mass, which, if you like, are contaminating the signal we're interested. One of the key ones is to do with um, changes in um, the, the, what's called the mantle of the Earth. This is the solid component of the Earth. There are, there are changes in um, how much mantle there are in different parts of, of the Earth, and that affects the gravity field. That is nothing to do with ice, but it's a signal that's superimposed on what we're interested in. And so each, each technique has different advantages and disadvantages, different kind of corrections that you have to apply, or different um, issues that you have to deal with. And so um, they're actually very complementary. And we learn a lot. In fact, what we're working on here is we're, we're using all the techniques available, combining them um, so that we get a complete picture about what's going on. And we can sort of separate out all the other signals that aren't isolated um, uh, using a combination of all the different observations. Um, and yeah, and, and in that way, actually, you can learn more than just what's happening to the ice. You can find out about what's happening to the solid earth and the ice ocean interactions, and also what's happening at the surface in terms of variability in snowfall as well. So the, the lithosphere, um, which is like the crust of the earth, is elastic. And what that means is that if I put something very heavy on it, it actually goes down, it depresses. And if I take the thing off, it bounces back up. Now, an elastic response is instantaneous, but there is also what's called a viscous component. So um, if, I, if I load the Earth with a lot of ice, and with Antarctica has got, you know, it's five kilometers thick, it's a lot of ice, and I take some of that off, the solid Earth does rebound back, but part of that response is a very slow one that can take many thousands of years to fully relax. One of the great things about these satellite observations is that they're telling us far more than we ever knew about how the ice sheets respond to forcing from the oceans and the atmosphere. Um, so that's, that's a great bonus. The, the, the negative is that we only really have about a 20-year record of, of really high-quality satellite observations that, that are particularly useful for this. But over the last two decades, 
one thing that we've seen, which is is sort of incontrovertible, you know, which n nobody really argues with, because all the observations show the same thing, is that that mass loss from parts of Antarctica, a part called West Antarctica, which we believe is particularly vulnerable to um, forcing from the ocean, and most of the margins of the Greenland ice sheet have been losing mass at an accelerating rate. So the rate of loss has increased pretty much, pretty much every year that we've made the observations. In the 1990s, um, the mass loss from Western Antarctic and Greenland seemed to be quite, quite small, close to the detection limit in the early 90s, and it has increased continuously up until the present day. And it's currently, so 2013, you know, it's a maximum in terms of mass loss. There are some recent papers that have come out that have shown that in just the last, uh, I think, three or four years, the volume change of Antarctica and Greenland has, has doubled. In other words, the rate of loss has roughly doubled in that time. One of the, one of the great things about it, these both satellite technologies I've talked about, that's the altimetry and the gravity missions, is that they can make observations over the whole ice sheet, over the whole of Greenland and, and almost all of Antarctica now. Um, there's a little hole at the pole in Antarctica, but you know, all of Greenland for sure. And um, we, what, what we see in Greenland is that there's, there's big um, elevation changes, lowering of the elevation around the margins, and a very, very small increase in the interior, which is what you would expect in a warming climate. So this is what all the numerical models suggest, that if you warm the, the, the climate in the Arctic and, and, and warming in the Arctic has been about double the global average over the last few decades. Um, precipitation that, and therefore snowfall does increase, but all the numerical models suggest that that is outweighed by increased losses around the edges. And that's pretty much exactly what, we're, what the observations are showing us. A situation with East Antarctica is um, a bit more complex than for Greenland because uh, for two reasons, it's, it's 10 times the size of Greenland and the signals, the change in elevation and the change in mass that we're measuring with Grace are much smaller than Greenland. Greenland has a big signal. It's well above the noise threshold. East Antarctica, um, the signals we're looking for are quite close to the sort of threshold of what we can detect. And so I think it's fair to say that the jury is still out on whether East End, how, how out of balance, how much mass is being lost or gained um, is happening in East Antarctica. Um, and the, the best estimates that we have suggest that it's, it's pretty close to balance. Doesn't look like it's gaining a lot or losing a lot, but the, error, the errors on those estimates are quite large. So um, the, the, the interesting or perhaps concerning thing about West Antarctica is that um, a large part of the West Antarctic ice sheet rests on bedrock that's below sea level. I mean, part, part, parts of it are two and a half kilometers below sea level. That's a mile and a half below sea level. And that means that that part of West Antarctica is particularly vulnerable to um, oceanic erosion, to changes in ocean temperature and things like that. And the geometry of West Antarctica um, suggests that it's in what we believe is a potentially unstable configuration. And what that means is that if you just change, change the, the forcing a little bit, warm ocean temperatures a little bit, that that, that instability could trigger a rapid um, dis mass loss from the ice sheet. Um, you have a very rapid response and a large response. So large amplitude and quite fast. Uh, that's what we mean by an instability. And there, there are some fairly recent, um, very recent results that both, both from observations and from a numerical modeling study that suggest that we've actually passed this, this threshold of stability and that part of West Antarctica is going into a unstable regime where it's going to lose um, you know, an increasing amount of mass and that that cannot be easily reversed. Um, what do I mean by forcings? Well, 
that the most the two key forcings that act on an ice sheet come from the atmosphere. Um, so that is changes in snowfall and changes in surface air temperature or SAT. So in Greenland, around the margins of well, quite a large area around the edges of Greenland, there is melting at the surface in summer. And if you turn the thermometer up a bit, that melting is going to increase. That's pretty much an instantaneous reaction. And you dump more snow on the surface and you know it's going to build up. So that's that's what the atmosphere can do. And another important, particularly important interaction, um, more for Antarctica than Greenland, is um, around the margins of Antarctica there are um, the, 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 the ice sheet is directly in contact with the ocean. And what that means is that um, you can, if you, if you change the temperature of the ocean or you get more warm water to these contact points, the, the ice can, can melt from beneath rather than from above um, at a faster rate and that can in induce some of these instabilities that I talked about earlier on. Antarctica and Greenland um, are, you, you have to think about slightly differently in terms of what might, what might um, make them change their mass loss or mass gain. Because in Antarctica, the, the mean annual air temperatures are pretty much everywhere, except for the real northern tip, are way below freezing. So there's really very little surface melt in Antarctica. And the big changes in Antarctica are likely to come from ocean forcing changes in ocean temperature, okay? In Greenland, it's a somewhat different situation. Parts of Greenland are in contact with the ocean, but, but um, a significant, um, almost, al almost half, a little bit less than half of the mass lost by the ice sheet is lost through surface melting. And that responds directly to changes in air temperature. So in Greenland, um, there's some work that's been done and this is a bit complicated to explain, that suggests that if the temperature in Greenland goes above, it, it increases by about two degrees above pre-industrial, that the ice sheet is no longer really um, sustainable, that it, it will go into a permanent decline. And the reason for that is that, that um, melting will, at the surface will, in, will increase and go further inland to higher elevations and um, gradually the top of the ice sheet will get lower and lower and in fact the elevations will go down everywhere where there's melting and as the elevation goes down the temperatures go up because of something called the lapse rate feedback. You know the higher you are in the atmosphere the colder it is and so the lower you are the warmer it is so there's a positive feedback if you melt the surface and it goes down, it, the surface gets warmer because it's at lower elevation. Now that positive feedback, according to the numerical models, will, will mean that for a temperature rise of two degrees above pre-industrial, roughly, um, Greenland may not be a sustainable ice mass. So that means, what does that mean? It means that over, probably over thousands of years, it, it, it it will um, reduce in size to something very, very small. Um, the theory or the, the concept, it's called the small ice cap instability. And mm -hmm. So Greenland um, has, a, I think, about 7.3 meters of sea level equivalent in it. Um, and I, I, I don't know, you might, that's, that's about what, 25 feet or something. You might, you might think that that doesn't sound so bad, but um, you know, the sea level rise over the last century was 15 to 18 centimetres, okay? And the sea level rise around about a metre, um, it's suggested, would um, displace potentially up to 200 million people. So even we, we are very, very vulnerable as a species to relatively small changes in sea level. There are countries like Bangladesh, the Netherlands, and all the atolls in the South Pacific, which would be absolutely devastated um, from a sea level rise of more than a metre. M 
most of the work that I, I'm involved in um, is about what impact the atmosphere and ocean might have on the cryosphere. You know, and, and it's, it's a fairly simple relationship if you warm the planet, you know, ice tends to melt. So, um, but it's, you know, the, in complex ways um, in Antarctica, there'll be a, a lag between, you know, warming and a response and all this sort of thing. Um, so some of those things I'm, I'm, I'm looking at, but there are also other, there are potential feedbacks from melting of the cryosphere on the rest of the planet, on the rest of the Earth system. One of the, one of the ones which, um, uh, I mean, a number of scientists, particularly oceanographers, have been looking at for some years is the potential for um, significant melting from Greenland to interfere with the large scale ocean circulation that makes this part of Europe, Northwest Europe, about three degrees warmer than it would be without the warm water coming from the Gulf Stream near the Gulf of Mexico all the way up past the coast of Scotland um, and warming and then sinking in the North Atlantic in two areas called the Labrador Sea and Erminger Sea, just south of Greenland, where they release a lot of heat. And those two areas just south of Greenland happen to be areas where um, the ice sheet does um, dump quite a lot of fresh water. And so if that amount increased, the, the question is raised, you know, could that affect somehow ocean circulation? It's a, a still a very active area of research. And so um, I think that the, the general consensus is at the minute is that uh, the rates of input of fresh water from Greenland are not sufficient to have a, a, a really dramatic effect on what's called the thermohaline circulation or this ocean conveyor belt. But um, it's, you, you know, a lot of papers are being published on this and um, there, there is some recent work that suggests that it, it may have some effect. It won't shut it down, it won't stop, there won't be some sudden kind of collapse of the, the circulation, but it could weaken it a little bit. So some of the workers looked at uh, the kind of, they're, they're called hosing experiments because what you're doing is you're getting a load of fresh water and you're pouring it into the ocean around the coast of Greenland and they call that a hosing experiment. And so some people have studied, looked at these hosing experiments where um, they really dump a lot of fresh water into the North Atlantic. Does the, the circulation shut down altogether? Well, if you put enough in, it does. But it doesn't look like Greenland is ever going to pump that much in. But they have looked at, you know, sensitivity studies, they're called, to see, yeah, to see whether um, it would have an effect. And there are effects, but they seem to be relatively subtle rather than major perturbations to the climate system. If you look at a uh, map, and I should say that I'm in a geography department, so I, I quite like maps and I do a lot of work with maps. Um, um, if you look at uh, the Southern Hemisphere or the South Pole and North Pole, they are completely different. They're almost the opposite of each other. The Arctic is actually the smallest ocean in the world and it's virtually landlocked. So it's an ocean almost completely surrounded by land. There are a few areas where water, the ocean can go in and out, but they're quite small. They're called straits. Um, and in the Arctic in winter, that ocean is covered by this thin film of sea ice that I mentioned earlier. The Antarctic, it's the opposite. You've got a very large continent, a continent that is bigger than the conterminous USA. It's one and a half times the area of Australia, dumped on the South Pole, large continent, surrounded by um, the biggest ocean circulation in the world, which is called the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. So the setting of Antarctic and Greenland is very different. The changes in sea ice that we have seen during the satellite era, which have made observations, which is a bit longer than the ice sheets, it goes back to about the mid 1970s. So it's almost a 40 year record, show um, a pretty continuous decline in what's called multi-year ice in the Arctic. And this, 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 this trend, very dramatic trend, in reduced sea ice area in the Arctic, is, as some people have pointed, is the poster child of kind of climate change research because it's a big signal, it's unequivocal, the sea ice is getting smaller and smaller, and it's a very important component of um, the, the global energy balance because 
Sea ice is, is one of the brightest, when it's covered in snow, it's one of the brightest natural surfaces on the planet. It is, you know, snow is the brightest natural surface. So it reflects a lot of solar radiation. Remove it and you've got ocean there. Um, and so, so people have been very concerned about changes in sea ice extent in the Arctic because it, it looks like it's on the way out. Uh, but something slightly different seems to be happening um, in the, the Southern Ocean, in the Antarctic, because the, the sea ice there doesn't seem to have got smaller. If anything, although it's a very small signal, it's about 2% per decade, it's, you know, it's, 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 and it's sort of moving around a bit. But if anything, it looks like it's getting slightly larger, extending. And, um, I mean, some, some people have, um, kind of questioned whether or, or asked, well, does that, does, that, does that mean that there's an issue with some of their theories about um, you know, global warming and climate change? But I, I don't think that's the case because the warming in the Southern Ocean is not nearly as pronounced as in the Arctic, so you wouldn't expect it. And the controls on sea ice extent in the Arctic and the, and the Southern Ocean are completely different. As I explained earlier, the geography of the areas are totally different. So the sea ice in um, the Arctic, um, there's a much stronger thermodynamic, in other words, temperature control on, on, on what happens to that. Whereas the, in the Southern Ocean, its extent is almost entirely controlled about, by the location of the, the Antarctic circumpolar current. Sea ice just can't go beyond that. So there were kind of different, different things driving sea ice extent in the southern hemisphere and the north. Antarctica, as I mentioned, is a huge continent. Um, and um, the, the, the most dramatic signals that we're seeing from the satellite data are, are coming from the edges. Um, and we're seeing big reductions in elevation and big mass loss around, around the margins of Antarctica. But something else that these satellite observations are indicating is that this, this loss over time propagates inland. And that's, you would expect that. It's, 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 uh, it's not a kinematic wave, um, it's, it's a diffusive process. But over time, as, as the ice is drawn down at the edges and the slopes get steeper and the elevation goes down, it pulls the ice from the interior um, at a faster rate to the margins. And so um, just because we're, we're the, the biggest signals are close to the coast doesn't mean that um, ice inland is not being affected or is not potentially vulnerable to some of these changes. I, I, I've always loved playing in snow. Yeah. Um, so um, I, did, I did a degree in physics. In fact, interestingly, I, I did it uh, in, in this university, so I'm in the geography department now, but I did it, in, and the physics department there has one of the most, um, I don't know if famous is the right word, but one of the best known theoreticians in glaciology in the world. Um, there are some laws and principles of glaciology named after this guy called John Nye, and he was actually one of my lecturers, and there were other people in that department who worked in glaciology as well, um, although it's never been that big in physics departments. And um, so I did physics, but I was always fascinated by the natural environment and how it worked. And uh, opportunity to work in geophysics related to glaciers and ice sheets came up for a PhD and the rest is history really. Life on Mars? <laughs> Definitely, I think that would be, you know, if I, if I wrote a paper which said I've discovered life on Mars, that would certainly sell. Um, interesting topics in, so I think one of the holy grails, there, there, were, there were quite a few in my field. One of, the, one of the big things we want to know is what are the ice sheets gonna do in the future? Um, but Related to that, and in, in the department I'm in, we do what's called a lot of paleoclimate research. That's looking at the past to help us understand what might happen in the future in when, when let's say, CO2 levels reach levels they were a few million years ago or something like that. Um, 
And one of the big challenges for our community is actually to push the satellite record, which is only 20, you know, the quality satellite record is only 20 years, push that further back in time so that we know something about what the ice sheets, particularly the ice sheets, because they have a long response time, what they were doing, um, say, over the last century. That is a real big challenge for the community. So I think the real thing um, that scientists have to, have to be sure they do, they have to be honest when they're um, communicating their science. And um, I've had quite a lot of arguments with non-scientists about, you know, well, we say this, we say that. And, and the truth is that actually most scientists are skeptical about most things. It's what we're trained to do. You know, we're trained to question everything. And um, in general, the, the science we do and the results we get aren't um, it's this or it's that, but it's evidence. And so I think we have to be honest that I can never 100% guarantee X, Y or Z necessarily, but I can say the evidence strongly suggests this or indicates something or, you know, if you look at all these different measures, it's telling me this signal and, you know, the balance of evidence suggests something. And so it's quite important to, to be honest about the uncertainties and the things you're not sure about, as well as the things you are. I mean, I think if I say I can't 100% guarantee that if you step out of a four-storey building, you're going to die, and I couldn't 100% guarantee that, you know, you could walk away. Um, there is a very slim chance. That, that doesn't mean that, you know, I don't know anything about falling out of buildings. Um, and that's, that's the problem we face, I think. Um, uh, and, and there's a, another issue, it's also how you frame these uncertainties, because if I, if I say to you, look, you're 95% likely to be absolutely fine when you cross the road, you'll think, oh, that sounds fantastic, I'll oh, cross the road. If I said, there's a one in 20 chance that you're going to die when you cross the road, you would go n nowhere near one, ever, you know, because that sounds pretty terrible. And so. It's, it's how you frame some of these problems as well and how you frame the uncertainty. And I think the language you use is really important. When I started my PhD, which was quite a few years ago, um, back in the early 80s, um, um, you know, global warming, climate change and um, what we were doing to the planet really wasn't, wasn't on most people's horizons. And I, I, I was studying, I was doing glaciology as a PhD, um, and you, you were doing it really out of interest. It was curiosity driven. But over time, um, the evidence has become more and more overwhelming that we're having a very damaging effect on the climate system. Um, because primarily because of our love affair with um, oil and fossil fuels. Um, and I think not just in, in my field, I, I'm very familiar with my field, and, and you look at any component in the cryosphere, and it's, they're all showing the same sort of signal that you know, they're, they're responding to recent change, or at least they are um, responding to what you would expect. They're doing what you would expect them to do in a warming world, put it like that. And, and they're pretty much all doing that. But you look to any other part of the climate system, you look to what's happening in the oceans and ocean acidification, you look at what's happening to the biosphere and ecosystems and biodiversity, it's the same story everywhere. And so I think the evidence now is pretty incontrovertible, pr pretty compelling and uh, very forceful that we're, we're um, making an uncontrolled experiment on the planet and we really don't know what the outcome is but I think one thing we can be sure about is that it's, it's not going to be nice and we're not going to like it and I think the other thing that I find uh, fascinating since I've got into this field is that if you look at the climate of when modern civilization has sort of evolved the last few thousand years you can say take the last five thousand years it's been remarkably stable it's one of the most stable periods over the last few hundred thousand years. And we're starting to tinker with that. And all the systems we have in place, agriculture, um, urban environment, everything we've set up has all been predicated on this very, very stable climate, which we're now starting to tinker with, you know, fiddle with the dials in an uncontrolled way. So I think that um, 
um, yeah, it's 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 you, you know we're creating an extremely uncertain future in terms of what what the climate is going to do and how we're going to have to respond to it.